Welcome back to the Skits and Giggles podcast. I am Pascal, chief instigator of this show and your host. I'm joined by my co-host and resident engineer, the Tom to my Jerry, Bryson. Bryson, how's it going today? Great, Pascal. I can't believe it's already been a week. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks. Um, we are also joined in our digital studio by the current fan favorite, the podcast debut of the year so far, and the star of episode one, James Drew of Bike the World, your purveyor of choice for the finer things in mountain biking. James, how's things with you today? I'm all good. Thank you very much. Doing very well. Okay. Well, I think before we jump into part two of the conversation, I think we just want to pause and say a big thank you for the great feedback that we've received for episode one. Um, we haven't really launched the this show formally, so we're humbled by all the kind messages. To reassure you, we have absolutely no plans of stopping anytime soon. So please keep sharing the show with your friends and give us a shout with any comments you might have. As I mentioned in the intro to episode one, you can find and subscribe to the Skits and Giggles podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most other platforms where you can find great podcasts. If you just want to say hi, just slide into our DMs on Instagram or um, find us on the interwebs under skidsandgiggles.com. James, we only briefly talked on the phone yesterday. Um, how are things on your side after episode, well, uh, episode one went out? Did you receive any comments on episode one at all? Uh, yeah, it was, I, I got quite a few people say, yeah, they thought it was really cool and really happy that we've started to do something like this in Switzerland. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing, actually. Um, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that, uh, you know, this is my opinion, so feel free to, uh, to get, in, get in touch or, um, you know, correct me if you think I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, you know, I also, well, obviously the feedback has been, has been very good um, and, and diverse, and I also got quite a few uh, follow-up questions that uh, listeners wanted to hear a perspective on, James. Sure. Maybe uh, we can pick one or two before we jump into today's topic. Is that okay for you? Absolutely. Okay, that's great. Well, um, one of the more uh, interesting questions comes from my buddy Gene, and uh, you know, it was in relation to our discussion around Pembry and uh, his initiative to plant a tree for every pedal sold. Um, he wanted to know your perspective on demand pressures from the consumer side for green brand credentials, as he calls it, and if you see brands going the extra mile in that department. What do you got on this? Um, I think there is pressure today. Uh, I'm not sure it's generally from end consumers, um, but I think it's uh, if, if you run a more sustainable business, and you look at things like packaging, um, if you make your packaging greener, it probably allows you to save a bit of money as well. So, you know, if you keep things simple, uh, if you maybe don't use a load of plastic and you use paper instead, uh, and really try and scale down the amount of packaging that is used, I think that's a, a really good uh, way to go. I think there's a few different factors that comes into that. I think that has to also do with how brands feel. Um, and how do you mean? We, well, we're in an industry that, that manufactures, so we produce material goods, so you use aluminium. Aluminium is not a clean business. Uh, so um, when you do that, and if, you, if you're conscious about these kind of things, the environment, which I think most mountain bikers are, as they enjoy the environment. And they don't want to uh, go out and ride uh, around in a load of plastic waste or something like that. Um, I think it kind of, it's something people think about and a lot of people will think, okay, what can we do to, to impact the environment? What can we do to offset our carbon footprint? Uh, I'm a big believer in that and often think, okay, what could I do to make things simpler? Uh, how can I drive less? Um, what can I do that which, which doesn't cause me to have a big impact on the environment? Okay, well, that's a, that's a very good point. And you know, as you say, I mean, this is clearly a theme that's on, uh, on top of uh, you know, people's minds at the minute. And 
I mean, you can see um, quite a few brands in the in the outdoors, outdoor industry or, or the, the bike industry in particular. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, as we mentioned last week, Pembry. Um, you've also men- mentioned one of your other brands, uh, Industry 9, that is also plastic-free, I, th- I believe. Yeah, that's correct. They uh, don't use any plastic in their... Um uh, in their packaging, yeah. uh, so uh, herb stems. It all comes wrapped in recycled paper. Mm. I know. I'd, um, I was just uh, researching. I mean, bang, basically on the back of this question, I was researching a little bit, and uh, you know, there's a big headline from uh, Cannondale uh, towards the back end of of last year, where they're gonna basically commit to to do their packaging even for bikes um, plastic free mm-hmm. and to basically design a new uh, cardboard box that uh, that would allow them to to do it with any additional um, plastic based protection and uh, you know this whole theme of planting a tree for every item sold or for every dollar earned or or, or uh, you know whatever other metric you use I think that is is quite common I mean uh, I think in the clothing industry it's quite uh, quite a thing i mean i believe endura um the clothing brand does it and um and uh, here in switzerland clearly as if you if you're around uh, instagram you will have seen nikin uh the brand that is also uh, quite heavily um investing into uh into planting trees uh-huh, uh-huh. and then uh okay maybe Bray, bryson do you have a a take on that or is there shall we move on to the second one yeah, there's a, a huge push in our industry for um, creating sustainability, renewability. Um, and I think it goes hand in hand with you know the F, the fact that we're going outdoors. So we want to preserve, um, yeah, this this ability to go outdoors, enjoy nature. It makes a lot of sense, and uh, I've also been carried away with it as well. Um, uh, even joining um, trail societies to help um, make sure. It, you do trail building correctly with, um, you know, sustainable way in sustainable ways to have less impact on the rest of the environment, as well as having a trail that's, um, really robust enough to, to withstand a lot of traffic. So then you have, you can have more people. Um, and I've noticed in the industry also, you've have, um, companies which are also making their, um, their, their clothing out of, um, responsibly sourced materials such as down and also using recycled um, polyesters and, and things like this for for their for their weather resistant um, lines which is yeah I, I think I think we're going a, a good way um, with all these efforts okay. okay well I guess you know we can we can summarize it in uh, you know some some and an increasing number of players are are active in that space and and start uh, focusing a little bit more on this but uh, i think the key takeaway is there's always more that we can do and uh, and i think we should we should all um you know have a think about what we can do personally to 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 make it greener and make it better for for everyone um <clears throat> maybe uh, let's take uh, a second one. Uh, another question we got from a friend of the podcast, Beat, also directed at you, James. <laughs> um, what do you think were the biggest changes in the bike industry in the last five to ten years, and what do you think will be the will the next five to ten years bring? Personally, and I just want to say that <laughs> before, is uh, I think this could be a topic in its own right. So maybe uh, let's give it the uh, the executive summary treatment, James. What do you got? I would have to say wheels. Uh, wheels and hub sizes is, is, in my mind, the biggest. Of course, you have changes in drivetrain, you know, from 10 speed to 11 to 12. And uh, There's you, 13, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't even want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> e-bikes. Um, it, it, <laughs> Definitely, definitely. But if we if we go from a ten year span, I mean, ten years ago we were all riding twenty six inch, especially in mountain biking. Now we're all riding twenty nine. Uh, I remember when I was working at Kona and these these wheel sizes started to come out, and we were all sitting there going, "What? Oh no! Oh, this isn't going to work." And um, but if if you look at wheels, um, I mean, another big one is geometry as well, which is super important these days and makes a huge difference to how a bike rides. And the original 29ers, I mean, they were long. 
they were long and they were big. And um, these days you ride it, you, you buy a modern 29er or a new 29er and they're fantastic. And I think so this huge push in geometry has come as well to fit the best frame around that wheel size as well. Because there are, of course, huge benefits with bigger wheels. Um, you just ride over stuff better. <laughs> so so I think a lot of changes has come through this and it's also affected drivetrains as well and chain lines, uh, all of these kinds of things. Mm. Well, I guess, you know, that's a, um, if you want to call it a leftover from, from the where the mountain bike really came from, right? So if, uh, if I think back to my childhood, early teens, you know, basically the, the technology that was used for mountain biking was glorified uh, stuff from the road scene so you know from hop standards to you know wheel to 26 inch wheel was kind of also an old older uh, standard that was around from previous days and you know the the flange widths and uh, you know uh, axle lengths and, uh, and all the other technology from that were around uh, in bikes at the time they came from from road bikes and so i guess it just took a a decade or maybe two to <laughs> get rid of these uh, historical dead weights uh, and and think a bit more freely about what a mountain biking really is and what it really should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I guess you know, I think I agree with your with your assessment in terms of what has changed the most in, in that uh, in that regard. What do you think is going to be the big the big topic for the next five to ten years, James? Well, I, I would like to see a uh, valve put on frames so you can fill them full of helium so they become lighter, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, maybe you should also lay off the cookies a little bit and the beers <laughs> and uh, you know get that frame a bit li lighter before you start complaining about a 10-kilo bike or a 15-kilo bike even. <laughs> no, sorry, joking aside, um, it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I do believe that geometry will develop more. Um, I think wheels is is probably been done. I mean, you do hear twenty things like twenty nine plus and and even bigger 32. wheels. Yeah, thirty two. Uh, but I think there's a limit <laughs> to um, to where we can go. And I think I think there'll be a lot of um, minor changes in the future. Uh, I think e-bikes is something that's also going to progress quite a lot. I've already been hearing people are building e-bikes that are sort of around 16, 17 kilos now, and they're really starting to refine that whole industry. Apparently, some of them don't even look like e-bikes anymore. So I do think that's something that's going to be pushed as well. And uh, suspension, I think there's uh, there's definitely some some uh, some openings there to uh for improvement oh that's very uh <laughs> that that's for sure and uh, <clears throat> you know if i if i'm allowed to get on a on a soapbox here i think uh you know electronics whichever way you look at it is um is coming and it's a thing and, uh, and obviously it pains me a lot because i like the and appreciate the simplicity of uh, of a bicycle but uh, if you if you think what uh, think about you know what's happening in the real world, be it uh, you know augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, etc., then you know there's so much more that will come in the next five to ten years. And I think you know what we are seeing today uh, in terms of electronics, you know, life valve and axis and all that sort of stuff. That you know in a couple of years' time we look back on this and it looks like a kindergarten party. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, a friend of mine works in this industry, so has a pretty clear view on <laughs> where these things are, are going. And, uh, you know, I mean, he has visions of, of uh, you know, goggles and glasses with data overlays. So basically think about, you know, you have uh, sunglasses that have a, a trail forks overlay. You look at the mountain, you see exactly where the trails are. Um, you know, you have all your telemetry data from your bike you know what is your suspension doing what is you know, what are your tires doing what is your shifting doing all that sort of stuff and i think we see a the grand the grand unification of of technology and and uh, and data and and you know the enjoyment of riding an actual bicycle and uh, with that i shall get off my soapbox thank you very much <laughs> i think you have a point there pascal i think the bicycle industry is heading towards with the integration of electronics and data and everything like this, it's heading towards a, um, a consumer product type of idea. 
And uh, I hope so, because there should be more people on bikes. And if it takes a little bit of technology to get us there, then we're all better for it. Um, I, I've seen trends in the industry as well. Like I've also been following for quite a long time. And what I noticed a lot of happened is you have like these breakthroughs, like extreme geometry, and then uh, they get dialed right back and then kind of uh, honed in. And what I think that's coming in the next few years is going to be basically more of the same that we have now, but um, some refinement. Um, and what I mean by that is like maybe a little more robustness in the in the materials that we use or we find ways that are manufacturing to save us a little more bit more money um just small steps that uh, just make things a little bit easier for um producers and consumers as well yeah i think if i can just jump in there that's something i just thought about as well i think the manufacturing process is is something that's being looked at at the moment i mean we've covered this before people bringing um uh, production back home, for example, uh, sustainable. It may be more expensive, but the lead times are way less, so you can sell more, which is always good. Uh, and also the technology is developing, uh, 3D printing, for example. I think that's also going to be uh, something we can uh, we can look forward to. I mean, I can't wait until I have a printer here and someone wants a frame and I'll just be like, wow, well, let me just print you one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you know we've, we've obviously covered a lot of those uh, those takes and 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 insights on uh, you know what the, the trends are in the industry uh, right now in the last episode. So we invite everyone to uh, to have a listen to episode one. Um, right on. I mean, let's uh, as we said earlier. I mean, keep the feedback coming, keep the follow up questions coming. We can always pick it up uh, in future episodes or get back to you through our other channels, be it on socials or on the website. Um, let's now change tack a little bit and jump into our discussion around uh, marketing, sponsorship and social media that we have uh, planned for today. I think it's a pretty exciting topic. Um, I know that uh, our uh, global head of the engineering department, our young friend here, Bryson, he feels very strongly about marketing and mountain biking and... Uh, I think we wanted to start a discussion with a, with a hot take. Bryson, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I just want to make sure everyone uh, checks out my Shreddit on YouTube because, you know, it's the, it's the new hotness. Uh, <laughs> joking aside, James, I'm really glad to have you on the episode for this second episode because the topic of marketing is something that uh, I think really applies to you. I've uh, cruised through your Instagram your website and you market very well you are definitely a professional at marketing and sales and uh, it shows through these two channels at least um however i've got a little bit of a tiff with marketing and i've sort of developed this yeah probably over the last five years or so um where i've just noticed you know such a trend of of marketing and shreddits and while the content is spectacular, and I give a lot of credit to these photographers and videographers, they are doing amazing work. Um, yeah, just some of the best, coolest stuff I've seen, even through other against other industries. Um, I just kind of feel that a lot of the way mountain biking is portrayed is not um, is not real. It's a little bit sensationalized, and you have these these fantastically um, um, skilled athletes doing all of these these tricks and um yeah to get back to the point it's okay okay bryson bryson hang on why don't you take the blue corner <laughs> and james you take the red corner and james what do you got on this <laughs> um fight it out let me put it this way from from a business point of view marketing is about sales uh if you want to run a business you have to sell that's 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 point. There's there's no other way. So you use marketing to get your message out there, to to gauge people's interest, to get them on your homepage, to get them to look at your products. So marketing is very aesthetical. It's it has to do with with how things look. Uh, and if you look at an end consumer, for example, you don't have long to impress them. You've probably got a couple of seconds. Uh, especially in today's environment where we have access to so much information, 
uh, we, you know, you go on Instagram and you just flip through, you flip through, you flip through, and you probably don't like everything you come across. So, you know, I use marketing and brands use marketing to really, to really gauge that person's interest. So it has to be aesthetical. It has to have this kind of, wow, that's cool. Um, and then afterwards, uh, you know, once once you've gauged someone's interest, then they probably start to delve a bit deeper into what it is, what type of bike it is, how much travel does it have, uh, what are the angles, and all of this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it's 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 very aesthetical. It's you need it. It's very competitive out there. Um, and if you don't do it, uh, you uh, you you will most likely not get anywhere. I get the fact that people want to kind of feel like they are um, this superstar, you know, when they're when they're flying down the hill. Um, maybe you can give us some one specific example of something that you try to portray in the marketing that you do for your for your company and your brands that you represent. What I aim for, uh, I use Instagram mainly. Um, that's I think my my most favorite medium to get my message out there what i really go for is is trying to to make my 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 like appearance the way i present myself as a company to look good to look professional and to look like um when people buy something from me they're getting something that's good quality um, and do you um enlist uh, any help uh no i should do because i don't really have enough time <laughs> to to do an amazing amount of uh, marketing. I do come from that industry, uh, so I do what I can. Uh, of course, I could do do a lot more, uh, but it's you know it's 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 also difficult. I I have to spread myself across the whole biz or the whole of my business, so I need to uh, focus on quite a few other things as well. I noticed a while back you did. Um a, a sweepstakes or a giveaway mm -hmm. for for a seat, a saddle. That's correct. And it um, it it kind of blew up. You want to tell us a little a little bit about uh, that? Yeah, it's, I've I've done a few actually. The last one was for a title handlebar and twenty five percent off of a Piger frame. Uh, so how it works is you set this giveaway up. Uh, actually, we did it through one of uh, my riders, Mister Flying Grizzly Bear. Um, he he posted that. So how it works is uh, you do this offer, you do it for a certain amount of time. So then people have to follow me, follow him, uh, leave a comment in their uh, in in the actual giveaway post, and tag two friends. So of course then uh, these two friends see they've been tagged. In something so they go and have a look straight away they say oh cool give, oh yeah I want that I want in on that as well so they do the same so so it's a great way to generate a following to get people uh, engaged and to follow your uh, your brand so you mentioned um, Frank flying grizzly bear mm -hmm. um, he's a, a freestyle athlete mm -hmm. um, and he also takes yeah he's also got some great content out there um, what what attracted you to working with him as opposed to maybe some other people in the um, in the scene looking to gain some attention? What what takes what what does it take to work with Bike the World for an athlete? Uh, at the moment, so that's that's an interesting question because things have changed quite substantially in the last couple of years, uh, and I, 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 I'm not particularly keen on the word influencer. But I think that's what a lot of people are looking for these days. And I know athletes aren't particularly keen on that word either. But it comes back to marketing and it comes back to sales and it comes back to, to trying to drive people to your products. And someone who has a big following, has a large engagement with, with people, and can promote your product is potentially very interesting because these days you can uh, you can hook your web shop up straight to a post. So you can, you can have a picture or a video of of um, a bike, a brand, someone doing some some funky tricks, 
and uh, they can click on a product and go straight to your web shop. And so that also inc increases, you know, your sales and, and, and interest. So these kind of things are, are key. What's maybe a bit sadder uh, when it comes to, I'd say, modern marketing is I think it's increasingly more difficult for athletes who purely want to race, uh, want to do the best they can, want to get good results and maybe aren't very interested in uh, being on social media and, and being out there and promoting themselves. I think it's becoming increasingly difficult. I mean, back in the day when I started, that's what we looked for. We looked for guys who were, you know, winning winning the slope style contests or winning the downhill races. And that's who we were going after. And, and that's who the end consumer was looking at, you know, Hey, my local guy, he just won, you know, the, um, the the Swiss Downhill Cup, for example. And, hey, what's he riding? What's Hey, check his bike out. Look what he's got on there. And, and that's what was working. But I find it's, it's, yeah, it's becoming increasingly more difficult unless you're right at the top, you know, unless you're, uh, you know, winning World Cup races. It's, it's more difficult, but guys doing that will have a team who are taking care of their social media and their marketing for them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's, of course, there's a, you know, a flip side to that, right? So there's, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, of course, uh, social media is, is clearly where the most interest is right now. And, you know, you're saying that, uh, yes, for, for athletes and, and like racer types, um, it's increasingly difficult to, to make an impression in that space. And I fully agree, um, but you know, there's also the side of the more traditional marketing channels and and community engagement. So someone like uh, you know that is, you know, maybe not the top racer, but he's like super involved in the local community. He has uh, you know he has a lot of friends in high places. Let's call it that way, etc. What do you what is your take on that? Does that is that still value to a brand or value to a business in terms of marketing, or is that that train has left the station, so to speak? No, I think that still has value. I mean, I don't work with with any riders quite that high up. I tend to focus on my market and and what works in my market. Uh, I do think it's still there. But I do think there's there's definitely a change happening, um, and and I think there are there's a lot of companies out there looking for people, especially young young people who know their way around social media. I mean, there's very very little books written on this kind of thing. I know it's happening now, and you can take courses, but it's it's very it's very much something that the younger generation understands, and us old farts don't. Um, <laughs> So I think there is a change there, but I think there are. I think networking is is most likely also uh, does does drive sales as well. You know, word of mouth. Uh, you know, if I sell someone a wheel set and they're really happy with the service, of course he's going to go and set, tell his friends, "Hey, I need to get in touch with this guy." You know, he'll he'll hook you up, kind of thing. I think that's still there. I guess that's the I guess that's the value of uh, of social media to to us old farts. Is, uh, is of course you know when we're like super happy with a product and uh, you know I'm, I'm just noting that for myself or <laughs> similar similar aged similar aged. I think uh, I'm the oldest fart here. Could be. I, th but I, th I think Bryson's hasn't reached that that level yet, have you? No, I'm still I'm still dynamic. There you You're go. You're just a fart. But uh, <laughs> what I what I was trying to say is that you know that's obviously the, the the power of the social media and obviously staying on top of those trends, right? Because uh, even even if you're not a top racer, you're not uh, you don't have the most fantastic social media following. But you know, if you have someone that is happy with his product, he's more happy to share about um, his experience about uh, the product itself. He maybe takes a photo of it in like a fantastic location, a nice photo, and and then mm -hmm. feels the urge to post that to social media, like I do sometimes. But uh, <clears throat> And, and then obviously that's the stuff that you can can reuse and and uh, hopefully uh, channel through your um, uh, you know, th through your uh, media presence. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, stuff like that's great, and and that's I mean, there's the power of social media. And for example, an end consumer taking a nice photo of 
of his brand new wheel set, you know, by the Matterhorn or with the Matterhorn in the background. Um, it's, it's, you know, and you repost it, it's for free, generally. <laughs> um, so, and, and it gauges people's in, in interest as well. So it's, it's definitely an interesting topic. I mean, if I look at another big marketing topic, I mean, 10 years ago, we were um, printing catalogs. Uh, you know, filling shops with catalogs, uh, sending out a lot of print media, and I've noticed that's also something that's that's I think dwindling. I know a lot of people still do it. I don't. I don't. I don't feel there's a need for a catalog at the moment. First of all, that's there's an environmental aspect. There's a cost aspect, and if anyone wants to go and check out my stuff they they can do it online and most people spend probably far too much time with their noses in their phones these days so <laughs> the information's available to go and have a look at there and on that note I also I mean I have a B2B platform for my dealers as well so they can go online and they can have a look what we have in stock and order it they see their prices and they can order everything straight online so um uh, I think I think it's it's changing. There's there's a big change happening. Uh, I even built for one of my uh, customers a specific pre-order platform and a function which allows them to change between their price and the end consumer price, the retail price, so they can actually browse through the product lineup on a computer with the customer and the customer wouldn't, for example, see the shop price. So there's interesting things happening there. What do you mean? The shops are not doing that for free? <laughs> what, letting people browse? <laughs> yes, they are. Oh, buying stuff. <laughs> buying stuff for free. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's only you that gets stuff for free, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. This is still a very expensive hobby. Um <clears throat> Maybe uh, you know, a final point on this from my side is, um, you know, you said um, earlier that um, you know the the old fart repost, uh, the old fart posting on on uh, social media about his fantastic new wheel set or his uh, shiny black new handlebar, you know, that's great for you because it's free marketing because you can just repost it. Mm -hmm. There's obviously another side to that, and it's clearly the let's say the marginal value of any more pictures is is pretty low, and uh, there's also I think the, the the big challenge for uh, for sponsored riders, especially at the at the top end, um, when you think you know how much time they need to spend to you know and you said it yourself how much time you need to spend to curate. Um, your, few, uh, your your Instagram feed or other social media feed, and I think that's a topic we can also pick up later. And what, what we mean with curating, but um, you know how much time these these athletes have to spend on this, and um, because it's just part of the job. But if you're um, someone that is towards the top end of the sport, so let's say a top ten rider in the World Cup downhill, top twenty rider in cross country, you know. A, you know, let's call names, right? Lucas Hupot, right? Uh, top 10 rider in uh, Crankworx, stuff like that, right? The amount of time they spend on it, that's all time that they can spend on training, that they can spend on, you know, recovering if it's an endurance athlete, um, they can spend it on uh, progressing the sport. So it's basically, they spend loads of time on um, something that is not very productive. And uh, I think there's also... A reason why, for example, um, that superstars like Roger Federer or Cristiano Ronaldo or Lewis Hamilton, I'm pretty confident in saying that they are not dealing with their own social media. And I think the point I want to make is that uh, it's, it's a sign of the, the sport and of the industry that we are talking about right here is that, you know, overall, like the income levels are just too pedestrian. For mm -hmm. for the athletes to actually have someone that you know that does it for them, so it kind of, in a sense, it almost waters down their performance on the bike because they can't spend enough time on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so um, so that's I think personally as a, as an athlete, I would be very careful with uh, with balancing the the amount of time I spend with social media and and the rabbit hole that it really is. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, it's hugely time consuming. Um, so if, if you want to be a professional athlete, it's very difficult to, uh, to get to, um, to actually to be able to do it. I mean, if you have to practice every day or, you, or you know, you have to spend six hours a day working out, it doesn't leave much time for anything else, um, especially not social media. So, yeah, it's definitely a difficult one. And I think as, as it progresses and it grows and it gets to the monster, it's, it, it is already, actually. Um, brands are looking for influencers are looking for people who want to go out post and, and represent and make their main focus uh, about social media and not about racing. This uh, presents a very particular or, or peculiar uh, circumstance because as a, um, a young up-and-coming um, athlete or, or bike star, whatever you want to call it, um, you have to have this duality where you are an uh, outstanding athlete as well as a, a social presenter per se mm-hmm. or influencer and uh, as you pointed out it's they're they're contradicting uh, each other at some point in terms of the, the performance so it'd be it'd be interesting if we can get um, we can get we can athlete or somebody influencing on the channel to give their perspective I'm on, on this. that as we speak We're gonna, as you know. we should look into this <laughs> <laughs> oh okay well stay tuned for further episodes but it's a, it's a it's a really interesting angle to hear from from someone um, first hand experience with it what, what yeah no absolutely. especially if you say what uh, you know if what you say is true that uh, you know the the marginal value of yet another post is close to zero then you know if you're again you know if you're a top ten World Cup rider then uh, why should I spend time on 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 posting yet another picture so. Again, I listen, as we said in another, in the intro to the other episode, is, um, you know, I'm very passionate podcast listener. I've listened to a number of podcasts with, uh, with photographers, for example, right? So I don't really see why um, someone like Sm- Sven Martin, who's already, you know, taking photos for a number of top riders, be it EWS or downhill, you know, why they can't pay him an extra hundred bucks, you know, per race weekend or 200 bucks or whatever the number is. And then he gets access to their social profiles, and then he does all the uh, all the photo posting for them because you know they're just reposting whatever he sends them anyway. I think that's a valid point, actually, and it just made me wonder if if it's if it's going to go in in that direction because uh, I think I th- I th- it'd be really sad if you know people stopped racing and stopped competing because because <laughs> no one wants to sponsor them. Yeah, exactly. That is a hypothetical scenario, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, it, I just uh, one idea cropped into my head is is does it make sense for an athlete to join a team who then has a manager who who can can really you know take time to to cover that aspect uh, that could also be something that's quite interesting for for a brand you have a team and you have someone who's running the social media and the the athletes are just being athletes they don't have they don't need to worry about social media or anything they just need to worry about being the best they can be so it's that's a valid point that's quite interesting actually I guess you know the the challenge with that is and obviously there's always a challenge. Uh, is that um, what you lose is the authenticity um, of the social media, right? So you lose that social capital um, that you have with interacting with an athlete directly. You know, when you when you you know reply to a photo, you send a comment, you send a message, or whatever, and you think you're actually interacting with Aaron Gwynn, let's say. And you're super pumped about getting a reply from Aaron Gwynn personally because you send him a message, and then you find out like ten minutes later that oh man, that's just a social media manager, you know. Mm. That, and that obviously kind of is the flip side to that, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, um, I guess uh, um, what um, another topic I want to explore a little bit is. Um, you know, uh, we said earlier you you're working um, with a lot of athletes uh, here in Switzerland, and uh, you're focusing mainly on uh, on slope style riders and and free ride riders. Um, mm-hmm. Just for the record, free ride is not dead, so <laughs> they are still out there. 
flying grizzly bear mm -hmm. come at me. <laughs> and, um, you know, you, you work with, let's say, more the extreme end of the, of the sport, let's say. And um, what, uh, what drives that decision? Uh, I don't only work with, with uh, I would say, yeah, slope star riders, free ride riders. I do, I do sponsor some. Um, P I do still sponsor riders who are interested in racing, actually. Um, so, but I mean, the big, the big reason I, I probably invest more in the kind of slope style free ride type rider is uh, the backflips. Ah. All about the backflips. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, these guys <laughs> <laughs> doing a backflip. Yeah, I pay per backflip. Oh. I can't get expensive. I mean, I saw. Or it's even, not much. It's not much. There's the, the other guy that did the triple flip the other day. <laughs> Gets expensive really fast. <laughs> So uh, now, I mean, the the big driver for me to work with riders is like that is is it's pure marketing, um, as we were discussing before. You know, you get a little video clip of of someone pulling a backflip on a twenty nine enduro bike, and and that's like whoa, you know, that's cool, and and it gauges people's people's interest. Um, you know, when I look at it, I want to be able to do that. Um, I'll probably have to lay off the beer, uh, but um, I, th I think that's that's what kind of gets people stoked on riding. Um, also saying, you know, there's quite a few uh, cool videos of people, you know, ripping burns and uh, drifting nicely and, and all that kind of stuff, and that, that works as well. But it is the kind of extreme cool factor which, which works, um, you know, having a video of me riding uphill and that's it is probably less interesting than uh, than uh, than having uh, one of my younger riders doing a backflip oh yeah no fully agree <laughs> and uh <clears throat> what is your what is your take on um so yeah we said you know a lot of quite a few slope style riders and uh you know of course i follow most of these guys too and uh because as you say it is inspiring it is pretty crazy what what they can do and uh, you know mm -hmm. i could never you know see myself <laughs> throwing at myself <laughs> over these these jumps um <clears throat> but we're just too tall pascal let's let's, 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 let's say it yeah, it's, it's, we're way too exactly. tall <laughs> it's, the, the, it's, it's my heavy bones and uh my my <laughs> Dislocation center is dislocated center of gravity. <laughs> but uh, what, I was, what I was trying to say is that um, what, do you, what is your take on there is a, an opportunity for, for someone like, uh, you know, the younger Swiss slope stylers to also um, bring in a more Swiss angle, let's say, because, you know, I look at these profiles and, you know, I follow uh, Emil Johansson, Brad Reader, and, you know, Seminark, the usual guys. And uh, at the end of the day, they all look pretty much the same. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, would, I would think there is a, an opportunity to stand out in that space by, by bringing in, you know, I don't say you need to have like a cow or, you know, do a cheese roll or whatever. But, uh, you know, to, to bring in a little bit more of the local flavor and, and to, you know, not only showcase your skills, but also maybe some of the, the you know, the unique country, countryside and mountainside and, and uh, riding infrastructure that we have here in Switzerland. Well, well, first of all, cheese rolling comes from Gloucestershire in England. But uh, thanks for clarifying <laughs> that, James. <laughs> that, <laughs> that aside, you should watch that. That's nuts. Anyway, <laughs> that aside, uh, I think there's huge, huge potential. Actually, we have the terrain here. Uh, we have the mountains. We have the possibilities to get up into the mountains. Uh, I took I took a, a few Canadians. Um, uh, around Valis uh, a couple of years back, and they were surprised how far up our lifts go. I think I think in Canada, you correct me if I'm wrong, Bryson, but you're not allowed to build above a thousand five hundred meters. Is that true? I don't know this rule. Uh, okay. Well, they were telling me they they were just astounded by the infrastructure, and they're like, "Wow! I mean, there is there is nothing too too high or too steep in this country." So yeah, there's a huge 
um, a huge possibility here. And one thing I've noticed is there's a lot of bike parks popping up. I think maybe maybe even five years ago that was still a little bit of a sore subject. Um, I think one issue here is land rights. A lot of land is privately owned in the mountains, so you just can't build a trail anywhere unless it's your land. Although even if it is your land, you need to get a permit for it. So I, I, it's, it's, I mean, it's exploded, and I think now there's a huge population. Uh, it, well, there's huge potential to kind of push Switzerland as as a riding mecca um, to really say, hey, here we are, look what we've got, and and really show the world that that uh, Swiss, Switzerland is here, and we have some of the best riding on the planet. I do find these days marketing is very U.S. Canada based. Um, I've noticed we're starting to get quite a bit out of the UK and you know New Zealand, Norway, Sweden pop up quite a bit. Uh, but I think there's the bra, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yet the bra. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, I think there's huge potential here, um, and people need to get out there and do that. Of course, it's also a money question. Uh, do you, you know you need to have the money to get a film crew? You need to have experience to know what you're doing. But I, I do think it's slightly underrepresented. I think everyone knows Switzerland, and they all know the riding here is second to none. Uh, but I think mm. I think from a marketing aspect, a bit more could be done. Actually, mm. no, it's just uh, you know on the point that you mentioned with the uh, the the private. Uh Land ownership mm. and stuff. So I know from uh, one particular trail that uh, is uh, is about to be about to be built. I think this year. I'm not going to name the destination. Uh, it's a very famous trail. It may or may not be an Imba <laughs> trail. Um, they are um, building a new trail uh, that goes along it um, to you know to divert some of the mm -hmm. foot traffic. And apparently, on a three and a bit kilometer stretch of the trail, there's a hundred and sixty landowners, <laughs> and they need to talk to all of those guys and need to get them all on the same page so they can build. Yeah, the trail. you just need one I of mean, them to say no. <laughs> exactly. That's why it took so long. But uh, but yeah, no. So I, I think the um, <clears throat> just to, to finish up what you said, the. Um, you make an interesting point, but uh, I think the what is also important to add to that equation is that you know you want you need to know what the the destination wants to portray mm -hmm. itself, um, you know what they want to achieve, what kind of riders they want to um, attract, right? So I know, for example, one of my favorite riding destinations is uh, is Davos, and um, you know their let's say their PR. They don't necessarily want like this extreme um, ridership. So, like you know, that we know from Lenzer Heide. Lenzer Heide has the bike park. It has the World Cup downhill. It has uh, you know the, all the other trails in the bike park. And and Davos kind of wants to um, um, separate itself from that a little bit and and kind of branding itself for like the the technical trail connoisseurs kind of destination. Mm -hmm. They don't want the, the racer type really. Um, um, and that also that's what they invest quite a bit of um, um, money in. But I guess, as you say, I mean, there's a, a big opportunity for, for some of those riders um, to, to work with the destinations to, you know, to get the message out and, and uh, you know, produce some, some cool mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And what you said about divorce sounds interesting. I think diversity is... Is is something that could could really, as from a marketing point of view, I think diversity in the different types of riding available here, whether it's you know the thousands of pump tracks being built or have been built, uh, to single trail to enduro to I mean, I've ridden some trails here which I just don't want to ride again. They were too too dodgy. Um, <laughs> Um, and then you know there's, there's the whole downhill there's the bike parks uh, not only that uh, gravel is a huge scene here as well um, road biking I mean there's loads and loads of uh, passes over the Alps um, just need to make sure you don't get run over by a Porsche 
but um, I think there's this huge diversity here, and and Switzerland's quite densely populated. Everything's pretty close, so there's I think there's huge opportunities here to really push that as you know a very bike friendly country. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and that's obviously also you know something we. Um you know, we try to explore with uh, with this podcast is obviously exactly to, you know, to talk about how fantastic it is and, uh, you know, um, so how people can find out a little bit where, where they can go, what are the, the spots for which type of riding, you know, who are the, the people that they need to talk to, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's like five or six trails just behind my house, you know, up on the local Zurich Hill. Um, and, and everyone around here knows about them, but I have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of buddies who come from other parts of Switzerland and they're always like blown away. They're like, oh my God, I didn't realize you guys have this kind of riding in Zurich, you know, <laughs> the biggest city in Switzerland. So it's, it's, I think there's definitely potential. I will concur. Uh, coming from British Columbia, I rode across the sea to sky and in some other interior areas. And I do have my favorite spots. Um, of course, I always knew Switzerland as being a mountain country with the Alps and the Alpine riding and such. But I never really understood the diversity and uh, the complexity and and how many how many trails there are. Um, because essentially, you can ride your bike on almost any uh, Wanderweg, which is a hiking trail. Uh, but but also. I mean, you can just use these as access, basically, because there are other, so many other mountain bike-specific trails as well, and they do have um, everything that you can look for, from um, really rough, rocky stuff to flow and, um, yeah, even duff and um, the loam that's so <laughs> mysterious and sought after. Um, and uh, I'm continuously blown away by all of the various uh, trail conditions and types of trail features that I find when I'm riding around here. Oh, absolutely. You make a fantastic point, right? So, I mean, we're obviously also very fortunate. I mean, if I, if I peek over, over the border uh, to Germany and, <clears throat> you know, remind myself of the trail rules in uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, with its uh, two-meter rule that you're not allowed to ride on any path or trail that's below two meters wide, etc., and it only has relatively limited bike infrastructure. I know Freiburg in Breisgau has some trails, and, and there's obviously Totnau, who's very fam- that's very famous. But I think we, we do have it really, really, really good here, and obviously in Zurich with uh, with the local community and, and spending quite a bit of time on uh, extending that network and effort into you know the marketing of new projects and making sure that they get the necessary funding and and buy-in from all the stakeholders, including obviously the landowners and the city itself, um, that appreciates the, the mountain bike community and what it brings to, to city life, really. Um, because I maybe, apart from the North Shore in Vancouver, um, you know, which other destination in a, in a relatively big city do you know where you can, within more or less the city limits, you can you can ride on, you know, Decent, decent trails that have some that are reasonably good to challenge pretty much every uh, skill level, and you know, and I think that's something we we also need to highlight a little mm-hmm. bit more. I think for sure, for sure. I think that opens up a lot of um, possibility for some listeners <laughs> to get in touch with us because we would definitely like to know um, if you are living in a city or even even a smaller one. Uh, do you have trail access right outside your door? Do you have, uh, you know, maybe around 500 meters or so, uh, or even more that you can just start climbing right after, after you get home from work or maybe right out out the back door of your work on the ride home. Um, for sure, there's lots of places like this. And of course we, we're only human. We can't explore every place, but it would definitely be interesting to hear from the, the viewers to, or the listeners. All right, maybe to to finish up uh, to finish up the the sponsorship topic, I just have uh, um, two more two more questions. Um, the you know there is obviously the the, the follow through between the riders that you you sponsor that you you know that you promote on your channels, and and then on the other end is obviously the the people that look at those um, pictures and 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 videos. 
And how do you see the transmission from, you know, one of those young kids doing a double backflip and an old fart like me buying a nice, nice wheel set? Uh, I'm, I think seeing something like that gets you stoked to go riding. You might not necessarily, or you might be thinking, yeah, I'm going to do that too. Uh, but you might not, you might just, I, th I think it gets, it gets you stoked to go riding. Um, I mean, if I think to back in the day with like snowboard videos, uh, we, we'd watch snowboard videos on Friday and, and we were so pumped to go on Saturday morning that, you know, we couldn't sleep. So I, th I think it. I think it has that aspect. I think you see these things. You see these young kids doing these things. I think if you're young, I think it. It really motivates you to get into that and try those sorts of things. Uh, I think for us, we might we might have come to terms. I've come to terms with it anyway, that we won't be doing that sort of thing. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, age, age is only really, a number, if, James. If, if I was really drunk, perhaps, um, <laughs> then I'll do anything. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I think just seeing that, I think it just gets you stoked to ride and, and to see what's going on. It, it definitely gets me stoked to ride. I watch that and I'm like, oh, no, I need to go out. And, you know, it might be a day where it's pouring with rain. And I wasn't really planning on going riding. But, you know, I watched watched a few videos and I'm like, hey, what are you let's go uh i had a good one the other day i mean it was snowing like crazy i woke up in the morning i was you know flipping through instagram and and you know we had nothing had nothing planned with the family it was a sunday morning and i'm like what, what why am i sitting here doing this watching all of these people riding bikes and yeah got got my winter gloves on and and some other clothes, and off I went, and uh, yeah, I had a great time. I mean, the snow was too deep on the trail to actually go anywhere, but um, but he took some nice photos, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> there you go. I did take some photos, but no, actually, just coming down the dirt track, which was covered in snow, was was pretty pretty fun. Pretty spicy. So, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, you know that that it got me out there. It got me riding, and 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 you know, it's it's that's what you need, and. You know, once you've done that in the morning, the day is perfect afterwards. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's motivation, yeah, okay. my friend. <laughs> right. So um, I think um, we're coming uh, to the end of our time here a little bit. So I just want to wrap up with um, one um, little discussion, uh, maybe as a takeaway for, for listeners, maybe the younger listeners that want to get into into uh, the sport and, and look for support, etc. I think we, we want to do a little... Uh, with you a little uh, exercise of like what are your sponsorship do's and don'ts so so maybe as a do how how can a young rider today how can he uh, you know how he can can he stand out how can he make an impression and um, you know what are you looking for when you when you look for new riders do something original that always stands out I've noticed this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you talk about jibbing these days, you know, this, 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 it's pretty new thing, or not that new, but uh, you know, it's been around in snowboarding for it's a, new a in while. Mountain biking. And I think it's, it's, it's been around in skateboarding, <laughs> <Yes>. BMX. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. These little skiing. quirky things is it's 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 you know people notice it, people notice and and you know these also these things that's another point these things are can also be achievable by us mere mortals as well. So you know that's always fun. That's interesting. It's original. Um, I think promoting yourself. I think being prepared uh, if you want to ask a brand about sponsorship. It's super important you're prepared you know you have a a uh, dossier with information about you what you do what you ride uh what your plans are uh this this is hugely important because you have to think of it as like an interview really uh, i have been contacted by people before and like yeah i'm interested in sponsoring my name is this i'm this old and i ride this <laughs> and i'm like Okay. Don't. Thanks for that. Next. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, good for you. <laughs> Thanks for getting in touch. Um, but yeah, it's 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 you got to promote yourself, and you have to really um, you have to really show someone that that you can do it. You need to make it interesting. Um, 
if if someone wants to give you some parts or sponsor you in whichever way, it, it needs to be worth it for them. Um, I I do sometimes think there's there's people out there who think we uh, we are absolutely loaded with cash. Well, we covered and, that in the uh, first bike episode. Parts don't <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bike parts don't cost any money, and yeah, why wouldn't you give me something? So that is definitely a big don't. Um, another um, don't I would say this doesn't always apply, but um, is or a do perhaps is keep it professional. Um, you know, if you like doing crazy things in your spare time when you've been out drinking uh, and stuff like that, then uh, maybe keep that separate from your um, from your legal name, your, shall we say? <laughs> yeah, from your profile that you're kind of kind of going to going to promote. Uh, I see it less these days, but I think probably about six or seven years ago, I, I saw it a bit too more. Uh, sort of um, some riders doing very unrelated bike things uh, on their social media profiles um, and you know as I might think it's cool a lot of other mountain bikers might think it's cool but you have to realize there might be some people out there who don't think it's so cool and you know if it's a young kid uh, who wants to get into biking and you know wants his, his mum and dad to buy some cool parts and then the mum and dad see, you know, maybe some questionable behaviour happening that might deter them. You know, they might then think, yeah, no, I don't know if I want my kids hanging around with this crowd kind of thing. So that's that's what I always recommend when I start working with a rider, you know, post stuff that you think is going to work for everyone, that everyone's going to think, oh, cool. Uh, if you think, I mean, if you want to post crazy things, and I mean, we've all done it, um, and and share it with your friends and stuff, do that. But then don't share it with the world. Kind of thing. Are you um, are you also working with riders that you take on to you know, let's say, clean up their uh, their social media profile? Uh, no, I leave that up to them. Actually, I mean, it's something I always look at when someone gets in touch and and to see I mean you can see very quickly if someone's taking it seriously or not um, so so it's something I look at it's something I always meet and, and have a chat with with my riders and, and I do mention these points um, I mean most of them will tell you I'm I'm not always the best behaved person um, <laughs> when it comes to nights out <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, we, we keep it among us adults, uh, among us friends. Um, don't get me wrong, I don't do really bad things. <laughs> shall, we say, shall we say silly behavior? <laughs> um, but, you know, it's always something to think about. It's always something to think, you know, how do I want to portray myself? I mean, maybe you do want to portray yourself as some crazy hell's angel type. Uh, then go for it. But you might find a lot of brands maybe aren't that interested in being associated with that. Okay, yeah, that's a, I think that those are some good, uh, some good tips for you know, guys out there that, uh, that want to get involved in this. And hopefully also some, some actionable ideas to uh, you know, maybe look at your own profile and, uh, and clean that up before you approach someone again if you, for, for some new parts, new wheels, new frames, etc. Um, Bryson, do you have anything more that we wanted to, you wanted to talk about? Yeah, Pascal, when are we going to do episode three? Well, I would say, uh, you know, we said this is going to be a trilogy with James because we have so much material. So let's, uh, let's just keep it, uh, keep the schedule and let's go let's get going again next week. Come on, guys, it's like 11 Star Wars movie. We can, we can do more than three. All right, <laughs> let's take up that challenge. James, uh, maybe just uh, to close out, uh, you know, maybe... You know, let people know again where they can find you if they want to find out more or want to send in their resume. Um, yeah, bikethewild.ch is uh, how you get in touch with me. There's a contact form on uh, on our site, and uh, yeah, you can uh, get in touch if you have any questions or want to talk to me. Okay, that's awesome. Well, thank you very much again for your time. This has been, uh, you know, again another fantastic, I think, uh, conversation, and um, I'm looking forward to next week when we talk again. Bryson, thank you for your time. James, talk to you next time. Thank you very much, guys. Pleasure. Talk to you soon.